Sheila, welcome to the show again. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, it was, it was so good. I, I, for our listeners, we've had you on talking about 31 Days to Better Sex. I, I believe that's the title of the book. Did I get it right? Yes. To great sex. To great, great sex. Incredible <laughs> sex. Amazing sex. Uh, and, and I know that we've had a ton of people have watched that. And now we get to come back and you've just re- released a new book, which is Nine Thoughts to Change Your Marriage, which Ooh. maybe before we jump into the questions, can we preface this in terms of we're really going to be talking about how wives can change their marriage. Is that correct? Is that kind of the right take on this? Yeah, like like the power that we have to make our marriages better just by changing the way that we think. Because so often we feel like we're stuck when we're really not. Yeah. So I want to throw out the caveat to our listeners because we get a lot of comments where people go, well, what about the guy? I mean, he should be responsible for da 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 And so I just so I just heard that we both would say, yes, there's absolutely a side that the guy contributes to the quality, the health, the satisfaction of the relationship. But for today, yeah. based on the book, we're going to be kind of looking at it from that perspective of wives. How do they influence change in their relationship? Is that, is that correct? Is, am, I, am I setting this yeah. up correctly? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I get that. I get that pushback too. Like, how come you're not saying this to guys? It's like, well, because guys aren't on my blog and they're not reading my books. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't think most guys would listen to me. But, you know, what I, what I do talk about a lot in the book is, you know, the first four thoughts are things that we can think about on our own that can change things. But then I also look at, okay, what do you do when your guy really isn't stepping up to the plate? So I'm totally aware that a lot of guys aren't. And and I'm with you there, wait a minute. And here's, but you, that doesn't mean that you're stuck. Even if your guy isn't doing much, it still doesn't mean you're stuck. There's still things you can do. Yeah, so I love this because our first question, I mean, we're just gonna create a lot of turmoil on this one uh, in terms of- <laughs> I love these... turmoil, I'm ready, I'm yeah, ready. Let's just jump right into the thick of it. <laughs> The first question is this, you, in your book, your premise is that my husband can't make me mad. Can you elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Being angry is a choice that you make. And I think a lot of us go through life perpetually ticked off. And so often the reason that we're ticked off is because of something that's going on with us. Now, that doesn't mean that if your husband commits some huge sin, that you don't have the right to confront him on that sin. And I talk about that a lot in the book too. But you know what? The vast majority of the times that we're ticked off, it's not because of a sin. It's just because of little things. You know, he left his underwear on the floor again when the hamper is like two feet away from the underwear. So what is wrong with the guy? <laughs> you know, or or he comes home late and he doesn't text you first. And so you just, you're ticked off through the rest of the night. And so what I'm trying to challenge challenge women to say is like, okay, maybe the reason I'm ticked off isn't always because of him. Maybe it's also because of something that's going on with me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because he might have left that underwear on the floor a week ago and it didn't bug you. You know, but today you're just absolutely upset. And this morning you had a talk with your mom and your mom made you feel guilty again for not being a good enough housekeeper. And so (laughs) it's not actually about your husband, it's about your mom. Yeah, that's a huge one. I was going to say the underwear one, I think most women can go, okay, I got grace for that, but it's the, it's the, you know, the in-law, the mother-in-law that, you know, is mm-hmm. essentially connected to him. And yet there's shame, guilt, you know, uh, wrapped around that. So yeah. you, you, you're saying is take ownership for your own emotional state. Oftentimes can be the trigger of the anger. It's not so much a byproduct of what he's doing. That's right. And I think we all have a lot of triggers for getting ticked off. I know I do. Like I get super ticked off if I'm tired. If I haven't slept well, anything he does ticks me off. Sometimes the sound of his voice ticks me off, right? Because I just want to be by myself. And so you go through life like perennially ticked off. Or, you know, to be totally honest, there are days of the month where I am hormonally ticked off. And we raised two teenage daughters and we figured out that there are certain times of the month. Because, you know, when you're in a house, all the female cycles start to go together, right? Yeah. And there's some nights where it's better just order takeout and watch a movie while you're eating dinner so nobody talks. And it's just safer. <laughs> you know? Amen so to that. <laughs> that's what your triggers are it's not a big deal right. like it really isn't a big deal to say okay you know what i am just exhausted and i'm taking things the wrong way here so so it's recognizing that this could be something going on inherently in you what would you say to the women in terms of owning that what are they i mean is it just cognizantly being aware or is there things that they can do to kind of um make sure that this doesn't boil to the top and all of a sudden they're taking it on their husbands Yeah, well, I would say both. First of all, when you're aware of your triggers, you can avoid them. 
you know, if you realize, okay, certain times of the month, I'm going to get really grumpy, then you can make plans to retreat those days of the month. If you know that when you're overtired, you get grumpy, you can make a priority to be, to get more sleep, all those sorts of things. But then the other thing that we can do is we can deliberately make changes to the things that we think about. Um, you know, I was on Facebook the other day and I saw a status that someone posted, you know, one of those memes, like those pictures with the words on it that people keep reposting. And it said something like, um, uh, you know, I don't just have three children, I have four. And it was a picture of these three little kids and then dad was doing something ridiculous with them. And I understand the sentiment, I do. <laughs> but I think sometimes we women especially really insult our husbands and we start thinking that way about them. I mean, your husband is not a child. Mm -hmm. And yet we often talk about him like he is. Mm -hmm. And the humor in the media it totally puts men down. And the more we think like that, the more we're going to notice all the ways that he does act like a child. Right. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he doesn't always act like a child. There's probably some super great things that he does. So instead of always thinking the negative, make a habit of catching your husband doing good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Catch him doing good. And then promise yourself that you are going to notice two things every day and say them to him out loud. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I noticed the way you were so kind to Jillian tonight after dinner when she was upset about her homework. And I just love seeing that great dad in you or, you know, I love the way you get up for work in the morning and you're not grumpy because seriously, I'm so grumpy without my coffee. I'm so impressed by you. Like whatever it might be, <laughs> even right. if it's something he does every day, you know, just notice things. Yeah. And when you have to catch him doing good, that's what you start to think about. And when you're thinking about the good things, you just don't tend to get as ticked off as often. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. And I think you're, you're also kind of identifying self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So, I mean, if you're constantly looking for him to be a child, he's probably going to fall in line yeah. with what your expectation is. And that is great. I'm one of the kids and I can just do whatever and not have to, you know, I mean, so I, I hear what you're saying and I think it's calling out the good and move, moving him towards, you know, again, I mean, we all know how I'm valuable respect and admiration is for guys to hear that they hear it at the workplace. They hear it in a lot of different places. I mean, especially in the military that we serve. I mean, they're, they're battle yeah. buddies. They're calling out that good and calling them up to that higher, you know, standard of, of admiration. How are we doing with why is that essentially what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, respecting someone doesn't mean they respect absolutely everything they do. That's not the right. point. Like I said, and I'm sure we're going to get to this later. We talk more about the book. When your husband's being a total jerk and doing something wrong, yeah, you confront him about it. Yeah. But I really think if we take ownership of a lot of this little stuff first, it is so much easier to deal with the big stuff. This is good. And I'm going to jump to the next difficult question here that I think a lot of our listeners are like, oh, I'm not so sure I'm tracking, but it's my husband wasn't put on earth to make me happy. And I think a lot of wives would say, no, that's actually the goal here is that I should be happy. And he's a big part of why I'm not or why I am. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been married for 25 years right now. My husband and I, we've been happily married for 20 and because the first five years were just really rough. Um, and I think that a lot of the problem was because I was expecting Keith to totally fulfill me. And because of that, I was always noticing all the things that he was doing wrong. And I was always noticing all the ways that I wasn't feeling as happy as I could. And the interesting thing is that when I let go of that and I started deciding that I was just going to love my husband, mm -hmm. I actually got really happy mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can honestly tell you now 25 years into marriage that my marriage is probably my biggest source of happiness on this earth. So I'm not saying that your marriage can't make you happy. And I think that God does want your marriage to make you happy, but it's a matter of what are you aiming for? Because as soon as we're aiming for happiness, what we're really aiming is for everybody to do things the way that I want them to do them. And you're and you're so your starting point is you. Your starting point is what I want. But if your starting point instead is is what does God want? How does God want me to act in this situation? How can I love my husband? Then you're aiming for something very different. You're not aiming for happiness, you're aiming for God's kingdom to come mm. and to have that be a reality in your marriage. And when you do that, you change the dynamic because now you're not testing them all the time. And that's going to bring the tension level down in your marriage. And that's going to change that whole dynamic. And it's amazing how that can often 
help him catapult into major growth. It helps you catapult into major growth. And pretty soon you're totally making each other happy, Mm -hmm. but it's what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. That's what matters. And that's good. I I have a feeling a lot of listeners are like, yeah, but I'm in the unhappy marriage. How, how, what would be the next steps kind of practically speaking for someone who's fighting that tension of, yes, I get what you're saying. Theoretically, I can agree Mm -hmm. to it, but I'm miserably married and faithfully enduring right now. Yeah. And good for you. And I really do feel for you. I really do get some support. Um, one of the loneliest places to be is in a lonely marriage. It's lonelier to be in a lonely marriage than it is to be alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when you are in that place, you need some support. (laughs) So get some friends, find an outlet. You know, what brings you joy? What, what helps you just to feel light (laughs) and do some of those things, you know, read more books, put some music on in the house, like do things that make you joyful. Mm. Um, and, and get some friends just to help get that different perspective, that broader perspective and keep going at it. You know, there was a study that was done, um, by Linda Wade and Maggie Gallagher a couple years ago in their book, The Case for Marriage, they talk about it. And they studied thousands of couples and they asked them to rate their marriages on a scale of one to eight with one being amazing and eight being in the toilet, you know, (laughs) and then took the couples who rated it seven or eight and they followed them over the next five years. And those who stayed together were far more likely to be happy than those who divorced. But not just that, um, 78% rated their marriage now as a one or a two, Hmm. you know, so five years later, it had gotten so much better that it was now amazing. And mm. so that tells me that if your marriage is in the toilet, it's not necessarily time to flush it. You know, yeah, <laughs> just, right. give, just give right. it give it some time, keep doing the right thing. And sometimes people just need to get over some stress. They need to change the dynamic in their marriage and things really do get a lot better. Yeah, I think you're so right. I mean, the, the, the it's transferring the where I'm finding my satisfaction and joy. If I'm putting that on him, it's going to be... It, there, it, you're, you're waiting for him to make those changes, right? And rather than finding your own joy, your own peace, your own happiness, you can control that. You can't control whether or not he's going to deliver on that. And I think even the pressure for guys to be, to be put in that spot can be oftentimes even the very thing that causes the unhappiness in the relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. Enjoy- Were you going to say something else? Yeah, I was just saying, you know, joy is something that ultimately comes from God. It doesn't come from your husband. Mm -hmm. Now, I like to say that joy looks upwards. You know, joy looks at what God has done for us. And then your contentment or your peace is something that you have inside, no matter what happens. And then happiness is what you get on the outside from your husband. So if you get the joy and the peace right, it's far more likely that you're going to be able to see your circumstances in a with different eyes, Mm -hmm. and that you're going to find that happiness that you want. I love it. I love it. So next question. Actually, I really love what you just said. I think that's such a, a, a countercultural perspective to so many couples that we deal with today. Like they have put, I think society tells us the derivative of joy and peace is going to be in the relationship that you end up doing life together. And yeah. it's just such a, unfortunately, it leaves people in a really vulnerable place. Because as yeah. soon as you stop delivering on that, you're, you're dependent on them making those changes for you. So I love that. I, I guess I want to move to the next question. And that's really, and this is, I think, really uh, another challenge for women. And I, I can see our listeners saying, wait a second here. What about the guys, right? So um, leave your comments below. <laughs> but, and you know, anything I'm saying applies to men too, though, honestly. So yeah, and I think guy, that, I'm, I'm hoping that comes through in our conversation because so often what we get from just the, you know, from YouTube viewers is, but what about the guy? What about the guy? You know, so, but I think the question is, I can't mold my husband into my image. Um, mm-hmm. What are action steps for our listeners can take to accept their spouse as they are? Yeah, and this is a hard one, isn't it? Because yeah. we want our spouse to be different. And I in the book, I, I sort of I listed four different things that you could do, sort of in a in a in a scale of like not so bad, you know, <laughs> just little steps we can take to really bigger things to start confronting these serious issues. Um, and I'm gonna get these in the wrong order. You know what? I might even have to open the book, okay? Because I'm gonna get them in the wrong order. I know one of them is ask for help, <laughs> but, but is that number one or is that number two? Isn't this terrible when you write something like a long time ago? You can't even remember. Hey. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, like um, like number one, 
what did I say number one? Yes, ask for what I want. This is sort of a funny thing. Um, I asked on my Facebook page when I was writing this, I said, okay, does anybody have any good stories about how asking for help changed the whole dynamic in their marriage? And this one woman told the story of how she was once um, – doing the dishes after Thanksgiving dinner. They were at her in-law's house and she and her husband were doing the dishes because um, that was their job. And the mom came in and started talking about Aunt Doris and how Aunt Doris just was not feeling well and how she was so lonely in that nursing home. And, you know, it was just so hard for Aunt Doris because her kids lived so far away. And then her mom left the kitchen. And so the wife turns to the husband and says, your mother wants you to go visit Aunt Doris. And the husband says, no, she doesn't. I know my mother. You know, I've, I've lived with her for 30 years. If she wanted me to go visit Aunt Doris, she would tell me. So he calls the mom back in the kitchen and says, mom, are you trying to get me to go visit Aunt Doris? And the mom says, well, of course I am. I, I've been trying to get you to visit her for years. And, and he was totally blown away because he had no idea. And so there she is. She thinks she's asking. Right. Because she's presenting him with this problem about Aunt Doris being lonely, <laughs> but he doesn't experience it as asking. And I think a lot of us ask in the same way that that mom did. Like we beat around the bush because we feel like it's rude. Hmm. It's rude to say, um, can you help me with dinner? You know, so instead we say, oh, wow, this is really rough because, you know, the baby's hanging off of me and it's just hard to get dinner ready. <laughs> And we're thinking, okay, if I'm saying it's hard to get dinner ready, you should be getting off your butt and getting over here and taking the baby. Mm -hmm. But if you were just to say, "Hun, can you take little Jimmy? <laughs> you know, he would probably do that. And so we need to start asking for help. It makes the it makes one of the biggest differences. Yeah. And I know it's hard to do because we women don't like to ask for help. It really does sound rude. But men don't experience it as rude. They experience that whole Aunt Doris is lonely thing as rude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, th and I think what you ultimately what ends up happening is when we don't ask directly for help, we lace the question with a lot of shame and guilt around it, and it comes across as, oh my gosh, th thanks for the pile of shame. In terms of, I'm trying to decipher what are you actually needing. You know what I mean? So I think you're right. It, for a lot of guys, they would say, just be direct. Tell me exactly what you need, and I'll certainly step up to that. So. Yeah. And you know, women really are multitaskers. We really are. And so we can be doing something and still thinking about 19 other things, mm -hmm. but he isn't. And mm -hmm. we don't understand that about guys. So if he's happily sitting doing something, he's not going to notice all the other things that need to be done. Right. He just isn't. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if, but if you were to say, if he's a good guy and you were to say, Hey hon, how about giving me a hand with the dishes? Chances are he would, you know? yeah. but if you sit there and stew and then talk to your friend about how your husband never does the dishes, he just after dinner, he just gets up and goes and gets on his computer and expects you to do the dishes every night. Whereas if you just asked him, he may think you like doing the dishes because hmm. there you are doing the dishes every night. He doesn't do stuff he doesn't really like. And so if you're doing the dishes, you must like it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so just ask him. <laughs> right. That's good. So that's the first one. What are you, there's yeah. four. Yeah, the second one we talked about a little bit already. Just you know, put things in your life that make you, that bring you joy. Okay, okay, um, that's so important. And number three, stop over functioning. Hmm. Just stop it. What do you mean by that? Let's say that you um, one of your major reasons for feeling unhappy is because you feel like you're more like a maid than a wife and a mother. You spend your whole life doing stuff for everybody else. Nobody appreciates you, um, and you really do feel like you do everything. The only solution to that is to stop doing stuff. Now, if, if, what's happened is there was a void because things weren't getting done. And so you entered that void and you took on all of those things. Nobody else is going to take on all of those things unless there's a void again. Mm -hmm. And so we need to leave that void for our kids to step into. And it really is okay. Like, um, let's say your son forgets his lunchbox all the time. And you're constantly getting in the car and going and driving him his lunch. It's okay to phone the school and say, I know my son doesn't have a lunch. I would appreciate it if you would just let him go without lunch today. He won't starve, but I want to teach him a lesson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. warn the school first so they don't call child services or something. <laughs> but like, it's okay to let people experience the consequences of their actions. If no one ever helps with dishes, it's okay to serve everybody cereal for dinner for a while you know, and not anything that requires that many dishes, like just quit over functioning. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's such good advice. 
you know, yeah. just in your book, you talk about not being, or that we're not called to be peace, uh, keepers, but to be peacemakers. And what is the distinction between those two? I thought that was, um, it's really, I don't think I've, I've actually heard anyone actually break, break that apart. So for our yeah. listeners sake, what do you mean by that? Now, this is a, this is a thing that if we can get a handle on, this can change everything. Hmm. Because a lot of us think that the goal in life is to make sure that we don't have conflict. So I think of a peacekeeper as someone who's sitting on the line between Israel and Egypt. Okay, technically they have peace. They signed that peace accord in 1979, but there's no actual camaraderie between the two countries, mm -hmm. right? You know, a Jew would not feel, an Israeli would not feel comfortable in downtown Cairo, an Egyptian would not necessarily feel comfortable in downtown Jerusalem. Like there's, there's not real peace. And so the peacekeeper is just trying to keep a lid on everything. That's all they're trying to do, keep a lid on stuff. Mm. A peacemaker, on the other hand, is someone who looks at the issues between the two parties and who tries to to figure out a way to get us both on the same page so those issues are no longer there. You know, so you think Egypt and Israel, peacekeeper situation, Canada and the U.S., peacemaker. You know, we're friends. We think the same way about a lot of things. Not everything, but a lot of things. Yeah. I'm Canadian. People can probably hear that in my voice, you know. A Canadian feels perfectly happy in the U.S. and vice versa. And, and so... A lot of us live perpetually in peacekeeping mode, mm. which is when there's a conflict in marriage, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to forgive and forget because we think that that's the Christian thing to do, right? To forgive and forget. But then nothing ever gets dealt with. Mm -hmm. And Jesus doesn't say that blessed are the peacekeepers. He says blessed are the peacemakers. There's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, we're called to actually deal with the real things. And that's why, you know, one of the other things I talk about in how to make yourself happy is to actually um, let people reap what they sow. Okay? <laughs> like, deal with the real issues. So, um, for instance, if, if your husband yells constantly, let's say that he's always yelling and he's verbally abusive to the kids or whatever, often what we do is we take that upon ourselves and we say, okay, what can I do to make sure he doesn't yell? You know, or what can I do to make sure the kids don't provoke him? And so he is the one who is sowing discord. He is the one who is sowing anger. He is the one who is sowing total unhappiness in this family. But the people who are reaping the consequences are the wife and the kids because they're trying not to provoke him and he's fine. Mm -hmm. And so we need to change that dynamic and say, all right, if you're the one who's yelling, you're the one who's going to deal with the consequences. So, I see you're angry right now, but I'm not going to stay in this room while you talk to me like, th like that. So I'm going to take the kids. We're going to go to Dairy Queen. And if you can calm down, you're welcome to join us. But otherwise, we prefer to be on our own. Hmm. You know, and just start. You're not, you're not angry. You're just stating it. <laughs> but, but start dealing with that. And then it's so much easier to deal with the issue because you've, you've got some boundaries there. You're saying, this is what I'll do, but no more. And so now let's really look at the issue and mm -hmm. let's see how we can rebuild this. Mm -hmm. But I'm no longer, I'm no longer sowing or reaping what you're sowing. You're going to reap what you sow. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, I think so often even and outside the Christian community, the we've adopted the truth of forgive and forget as like, that's actually a truth, right? And it's not, I mean, they, they, those don't go hand in hand together. And I think the other thing that you're identifying is that peacemaking sometimes often it requires some boundaries to be set, right? So, and that's not easy. I mean, it's not easy, but ultimately it's going to, the quality of the relationship is going to come with those things being put in place. So huge advice. Yeah. I, I, I really think that that's a, a big miss for many couples that they think they just have to roll along with quite honestly, yeah. some really bad situations that, you know, they, they, it contextualized as well that's just normal i just have to put up with it no actually you don't i mean yeah so yeah, <laughs> really yeah and i can always guarantee you you know if you're going to be a peacemaker the way through peacemaking tends to go through conflict hmm. you will have conflict in your marriage that's not a bad thing right how you deal with that conflict that's yeah. what's good or bad yeah yeah no it's so avoiding good. conflict together really bad idea seriously <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> let's go to the next one uh so i love this you, you, in your book you talk about being uh one is more important than being right so being one unified is better than being um being right in the relationship and what does resolution look like when i'm concerned with unity being than being right 
Yeah, so I'm I'm one of these type A logical people and when Keith and I used to fight and have conflict, my goal was always to listen to him intently. You know how they say you're supposed to be a good listener, right? I was an excellent listener. But the reason I was listening was so that I could hear the loopholes. Mm -hmm. So if he said anything <laughs> the least bit off, I could jump in there and I could prove my point and I could end up being right. But the problem with always being right and the problem with winning every fight with your spouse is that you're going to end up married to a loser. And nobody wants to be married to a loser. <laughs> so we have to change the way we think about conflict. It's not about winning. Because usually when we're in a conflict, what we're trying to do is we're, we're, one of us has to get our perspective to win. And, and that's how we address pretty much every conflict. Who's going to win? And we need to stop that. And we need to say instead, okay, how can we both win? And the way we do that is by figuring out what the real issue is. Because I can guarantee you, 99% of times people who are having conflict, the issue they think they're fighting about is not the issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I can give you an example. Like, let's say there's a couple and she's six months pregnant with twins. I talked about this in the book. And, um, and they have a toddler. And he's thinking, oh, my goodness, my family's going from three to five. I need to take good care of these people. He hears about a house, which is an amazing deal. And he wants to move in the next two months so that they're set up in this new house. And she's thinking, I'm not sleeping through the night. I have major hemorrhoids. I've got varicose veins. <laughs> I've got, like, I still can't keep food down. I have a toddler. There's no way I can move. That's just exhausting. And so they start this fight about whether or not they should move. Mm -hmm. There's no way to win that because who's right, you know? And so let's take a step back and say, we don't want to fight about real estate. That's not the issue. The issue really is what do we both need in this situation? What do you need? Mm -hmm. And if they could talk about that, it's amazing how that could change the whole dynamic. You know, he could say, I just need to feel like we're being financially responsible and that we have a plan. And she could say, I just need to feel like I'm not going to be overwhelmed <laughs> mm -hmm. and that I can physically do this. And as soon as they voice that, then you can start brainstorming. Oh, okay, I get that. Well, let's figure out how we can get a financial plan. Let's figure out how we can help you not feel exhausted. And maybe they'll figure out a new strategy that didn't even involve real estate. <laughs> mm -hmm. But talk about every time you're in a conflict, Stop what you're doing and say, hold on a second. What is it that we actually need right now? And both of you talk about what it is that you need. <laughs> and then it changes things and you can, you can be productive and you can brainstorm and figure out a way to, for both of you to get your needs met instead of just for one of you to win this conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think what you're talking about is that if we pause for a moment and actually think through what's the original emotion that caused the conflict yeah. What is that? Mm -hmm. And that's generally what you're talking about is the need, the need that's behind it. I also think there's an element of so often the need expresses itself as like it could be money or finances, but really the deeper issue that's really going on is there's a power struggle or I don't feel cared for, or I feel like our finances are yeah. out of control and I'm scared. You know I mean? Those original emotion is generally what we're talking about. I think that leads me to my next question. What are legitimate and illegitimate needs in a relationship? Yeah, I mean, a legitimate need, we, we all have, for instance, um, I need I need to feel like I'm your only object of affection. I need to feel loved. I need to spend time with you. I need to spend time by myself. That's, that's a legitimate need. Um, you know, I need to know I can trust you. Um, I need to know that we're financially secure. Like all of those things that, that go into a healthy relationship, those are really good. But for instance, I had... Um, I had a woman write to me a while ago and her husband um, was a pastor and he had struggled with porn like 20 years ago and he'd gotten over it. But in the last two years, he was just acting weird. Like he'd gotten a lot more angry, a lot more distant, just weird. And she was getting red flags galore. And so she asked him, she said, are you, are you using porn again? And he got so angry and he said, I have a right to privacy. You have no, you have no right to question me on this. And so he got really, really upset because he said that she, that he had a legitimate need for privacy. And you know, that's not, no, <laughs> like there are some things that no, we all need to be able to feel like my husband doesn't need to know absolutely everything I do, or my wife doesn't need to know absolutely everything I do. But I think having access to each other's phones or computers is perfectly legitimate, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you're in a conflict where someone is saying, 
um, you know, I have the right to do what I want with my Facebook account and you can't, you know, or, or, um, I have the right to look at other women or I have the right to look at other guys or I have the right to read erotica and you can't talk to me about that. And if you can't agree on those things, then that's sometimes where it's good to get a mentor couple involved or a counselor, someone who can sit down and say, yeah, no, that ain't healthy. Mm -hmm. We're not going there. Like this is going to stop. <laughs> and sometimes you need that other opinion and, and that other voice and in that conflict. Yeah. I, I, have you ever posed this question to your audience in terms of what are illegitimate needs? I'd just be curious to know what does that list look like? Because I, I agree with the one that you just brought up. And I think that's one that I, most people would say, yep, check the box. But are, what are some of the other ones that you say are illegitimate needs? I don't know if there's any that come to mind, but it'd be an interesting. I think, for instance, um, um, I, need, I need to know what you're doing. Like, mm. I need to know where you are all mm. the time. Or, or um, uh, a lot of them would be around finances. Like, I need to have, I need to have complete control of the finances. <laughs> you know, Got well, it. no, it's money. We need to be able to share that, right? Right, right. Um, now, if your spouse is spending like there's no tomorrow, then sometimes you have to take some of that back. But I, I mean, anything where you are trying to, to control someone else's behavior <laughs> is an illegitimate need. Yeah. And it might be honestly something that you need because you've got some psychological issues inside of you that need to be dealt with right. <laughs> where right. you feel like you need to be totally in control of another person, but that is not legitimate. Got it. Yeah, that, that's good. I, that helps clarify. I think in the mind of folks, I think that I would be asking, well, what are some of these other illegitimate needs? And that does make sense, right? Um, when it comes to control and saying, I, I own the finances, you don't get any right to it. Or, you know, those, those are... Yeah. obviously I mean again they're kind of no-brainers but it's good that we're stating them <laughs> but it's amazing how many people get it's in these true situations. it's true I, I, you, I would, so you would not want to know some of the conversations I've had with couples where I'm like is this a joke because I'm honestly I <laughs> you know and it's like no this de they're dead serious you know yeah. Um, yeah so let's talk about so I love this nine thoughts that can change your marriage and I think ultimately what if I was to kind of give the summary of it is that ultimately what you're helping couples connect with is that if you aren't intentional and these ch thoughts can change your marriage, ultimately the yeah. picture is that you're going to drift apart. That's yeah. one of the places that this ultimately can, t it can end up in. And I guess my question to you, what are some of the intentional ways that couples can stay connected? I like to say that if you can't talk about the little things in your marriage, mm -hmm. then you lose the ability to talk about the big things. Hmm. And a lot of us have these conflicts that we need to address, right? Um, these really big things. But you're not able to address them unless you're doing a lot of little things together. And so we have to make sure that we don't drift. Because what often happens is couples do drift and then there's a huge pile of these big things to deal with and you can't deal with them because you don't know how to even have a conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to do things, even really small things that can stop us from drifting. And I, I wanna give you some super practical things you can implement today that can do, that can do this for you, okay? Um, my husband often works out of town and sometimes I'm out of town too. Um, Luckily, not for weeks on end, but it might be three or four days or something. And when he, when Keith is gone, I get I have this horrible habit of starting like a new series on Netflix, right? You know, and let's say it's like a three season show, and I'll get I'll get like I'll watch two whole seasons, and then I'll be two episodes done from the whole series, and he'll come home. And that is so annoying because I just want to watch those last two shows, right? <laughs> and so I've had to be more um, uh, intentional about not doing that to ourselves. But the other thing is like when I start, when he's gone and I spend all of this time by myself, I find that he isn't on my mind anymore. And I, I lose a lot of that closeness. So what we've started to do is we connect every day by phone and we share two things. And we do this in person if he's home, mm -hmm. but it's especially important when we're not in the same town. Um, you know, what was the time during the day where you just felt in the groove, you know, like God was working through you, everything was going so well, it was amazing. And then what was the time where you were just the most discouraged and frustrated? So sort of like the high, low idea, but not exactly, because it's not just about being happy. It's about feeling like, okay, I'm productive. I'm just, I'm, this is wonderful. And we do that every day. And then I know what he's going through emotionally. He knows what I'm going through, but you also get a chance to look at trends and like, 
okay, you know what? I'm always totally discouraged whenever I'm reading my email. So maybe I need to do something about my email. Mm-hmm. <laughs> whenever hmm. But it just helps you stay in contact. And when you know these little things about your spouse, it helps you talk about just big things and you feel like you have that connection. Such an important thing. And it doesn't take very long. Yeah. But do it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Um, and here's another huge one. And this has totally changed in the last 20 years. This is a totally new thing. 20 years ago, every couple in America went to bed after the Johnny Carson monologue on The Tonight Show, or else they went to bed after the evening news. Mm -hmm. You know, they would be watching TV, that bit would be over, and they would go to bed together. Today, most couples do not go to bed at the same time. And if there's shift work involved, I totally get that. Okay, that's a different scenario. But if you're both in the house, what often happens is someone's up late watching Netflix or watching TV or playing video games, someone else is on the computer, and they just go to bed when they feel like it, and they're not going to bed at the same time. And that is such a bad idea. (laughs) So America, listen to me. Start going to bed together. And why is that a bad idea? Unpack for us why. Okay, look. (laughs) Let's say you want to have sex, all mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Half the time that, that we have sex, it's not that we planned it. It's just that we're lying in bed and we're talking and it happens. And if you go to bed at different times, you're just making it far less likely that it's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> because, I just want, you know, I mean, I yeah, thanks for kind of putting it out there. But it's not just that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not only sex. It's just, you know, you have that time to talk at night. You just yeah. feel close when you drift off together. Um. So go to bed at the same time. It doesn't take much. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is an interesting because I think a lot of couples, they, um, you're right. It's kind of the new standard. Like there's one person in the relationship who's the night out and there's the one person who's like the morning chipper, right? And they're like on opposite cycles and yep. they're missing in this way. And so I think it's unpacking why is that important? Not so much, you know, just do it because it's what happened back in the 50s. <laughs> I think most yeah. people no, say. I, mean to say that. I just think that a lot of marriages are suffering today for reasons that they didn't suffer in the past because people did this right. But it never occurred to people to go to bed right. at different times. Well, and I think it, it, coming back to the original question, it's about how do we keep the connection, right? And so yeah. these are little things that can really add up to the difference between you feeling at a heart level connected to your spouse versus kind of going through life feeling like, man, I, we're on separate pages. We're drifting apart. And these are, and it's not the big things. I mean, yes, it's great to get away for a weekend and, you know, have that romantic (laughs) vacation. Like we all want that. But I think those things are not going to fill the gap between all these other times where you feel like, man, we're just not on the same page. So it's really good. Any others that you throw out there to our listeners? Um, I think it's just so important that you do stuff together. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it is, but women, we like to communicate face to face. When we talk to a friend, we like to be sitting across the table having coffee with her, eyeball to eyeball, so we can see the emotion on her face. It's all very important to us. But women often assume that men want to communicate the same way. And so if your guy doesn't want to sit across the table and drink coffee with you, it must mean he doesn't want to talk. Mm. So, you know, you may say to your husband, honey, can we just talk tonight? And all you mean is, I just want to catch up, see what's going on in your life. But as soon as you've said those words, can we talk tonight? He's thinking, I'm so in trouble. (laughs) Like, what's going to happen, you know? But if you were just to say... It's such a beautiful night out. How about if we go for a walk after dinner? It means exactly the same thing because when you take that walk, you're going to talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but guys tend to communicate more side by side when they're doing something with other people. And so you just got to find stuff to do. And it doesn't even have to be stuff that you love as long as you're with him. Like my husband's really into bird watching and I enjoy it, but I'm not like I don't really care if that's a white crown sparrow or a white throated sparrow. Like it doesn't. <laughs> well, really, look at you, though. You know. I'm impressed. You even know the, like the yeah. different names. <laughs> <laughs> you know but he's like but but who cares if i don't like it as much as he does we still mm-hmm. get outside i get to hike that's good for you you know it's you get fresh air i get off my computer yeah. <laughs> which is important so even if it's not your favorite thing in the world just find something to do because spending that time and talking is worth so much so good well i'll tell you uh your book one of the things that I want to make sure our listeners know that not only is it packed with great information like you've just received, practical stuff, but actually in each chapter, you've put 
uh, an action plan that they can begin to walk out. And I think that's where the rubber hits the road, right? I mean, it's great to have yeah. the knowledge, the thought, but mm-hmm. how are we actually practically living this out? So I would just encourage folks, what we've been talking about is nine thoughts that can change your marriage. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I know that not just your books, but all the resources that Sheila has at her website, um, which give our listeners again, and this is all going to be below the video, but just real quick, what's your, what's your website? Where, where should they go to get all this great information? Yeah, it's lovehonorandvacuum.com. And it's a lot of fun there. It's a huge blog. I post almost every day, usually about marriage or sex or something. And um, yeah, great. So go there. And then for Nine Thoughts, I also have some free studies. If you just want to read it and get challenged yourself, go a little bit deeper. There's a free study that you can take on that too. Um, And I'll give you the link to that. We can, you can put it below too. And yeah. So good. And so for our listeners, as you know, we've been just building this library of amazing guests. So join us at oxygen365.com and you can get access to all kinds of great information, just like Sheila's delivered. So thank you so much for being on the show again. And uh, I, I can't wait till you write the next book, which will be focused on men. This will be great.